Hi everyone, welcome to this episode of Kuiper Labs. In this video today we're going to be discussing the nature of ethics in forensic science. So it's, ethics in forensics is such a crucial area, being able to, to make sure that the analysis that we do and the way that we conduct ourselves is above reproach um, because the stakes are so high. So let's go over some of the things we're going to talk about um, in this video. We're going to be talking about um, how um, ethics would apply in the scientific method, the way that we conduct ourselves the way that we report our data. Um, and given the forensic context and the fact that this will be involved in, um, be involved in going to court, that also covers areas of the pre-trial conduct, the way we conduct ourselves in the lead up to the case and during giving evidence, as well as some more general kind of concepts. So these are um, the points that we're going to talk about are adapted from the Australian and New Zealand Forensic Science Society, ANZFSS, um, their code of ethics. Okay, so you can follow that link um, for a little, um, some, some further details. Okay, so let's start with the scientific method. Okay, so the first thing is that making sure that we use accepted scientific principles and methods. We, we use things that have been well established, well studied, well documented, and with established um, procedures. You can use novel techniques if you need to, um, and, and, but you have to weigh up carefully um, what information they're gonna add, um, and you also have to be very cautious in how you use it alongside other techniques. So there is some scope for that, but you do need to be cautious. And, and also then thinking about the techniques that we use and the evidence that they give, we have to maintain or think about the standard of proof that's required for, for legal evidence um, in terms of um, what, that's going to, um, what that's going to require and also whether the tests we do can achieve that. Um, we've also got to maintain objectivity in the way we carry things out, whether it's tests in the lab, whether it's examination of the scene, collection of evidence, you name it. Okay, that we must maintain our impartial nature, that we serve the court, we don't serve one side or the other. We don't, we're not the ones catching bad guys, we just examine evidence. Making sure that we use appropriate experimental controls when we carry out tests to make sure that things are working, um, that things are working properly. Um, and that also would involve some processes like retesting or using alternative techniques. Um, thinking back to concepts of quality assurance and quality control that we covered in the previous video. Okay, those are all, would all apply here. Um, and also um, staying within the limits of our area of expertise, not extending the tests and things that we do to, to things that we are not experts in, but just maintaining um, th those boundaries. And also making sure that the, the records of our tests and things, so whether it's physical results, photographs, field notes, um, crime scene notes, um, test, you know, all sorts of reports and things are all accept, um, accessible. They're not secret proprietary information. They need to be available uh, for anyone to read, um, anyone who's, who's um, a party to the, the matter that's in, in the court. Okay, so now we think about, all right, well, what does our experimental report need to look like? What does it need to contain and how do we structure it? Okay, now the first thing that we need to make sure that we do is we distinguish between facts and opinions. Okay, so there's kind of the, the saying goes, you, you know, um, you're entitled to your own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own facts. Okay, and to a degree that applies here, that we make sure that the distinction between the facts and the results of the tests we do, and then the opinions that we, um, we extend those to, that we, um, we construct based on those facts, on those results. And also that we are open and acknowledging any limitations of the tests that we've done. Okay, we make it, we, we don't overextend ourselves. Making sure the language we use is as straightforward and accessible as possible. Now, we can't remove all scientific jargon, but making sure that given this report is going to be read by people who are not necessarily scientific, it needs to be understandable um, for them. And then also that we, when there's multiple kind of conclusions based on the evidence that might favour one side or the other, that you have to weigh up those conclusions on their merit. Okay, so that you, you don't just automatically kind of dismiss any po other possible conclusions that might come up, um, but you, you weigh them carefully. Okay, you, they're not necessarily all equal weight, but you do um, give them consideration. Okay, you also got to recognise that um, <clears throat> different experts may reach different valid opinions based on a given set of facts or a given items of evidence. Okay, that can be for a range of reasons that may or may not have anything to do with the credibility or it might to do with experience or maybe they've dealt with uh, you know, different kind of case histories in their past um, career that then can inform the way that they would, um, ba what they would base their opinion on. Um, you know, and, and that's quite reasonable, but the idea is that that needs to be accepted 
acknowledged that that can happen. It doesn't mean that one is wrong and one is right necessarily. It might just be an alternative point of view. Um, but also, yeah, and so being open and accepting of that and um, and that also can then lead to productive discussion about how that um, how that could come about. Because sometimes that people in court would tend to say, okay, well, you have different views, therefore they cancel each other out, no one's right. Or that they want to determine which is right and which is wrong. But you know, also needing to communicate the fact that there is more than one possible opinion that may arise legitimately. Sometimes it's not legitimate. Maybe someone is, is misunderstanding or misinterpreting the facts or there, there are other things at play, but it is possible. Okay, you also need to refer to all items examined. Everything needs to be on the table. If you've tested the item, you need to refer to it in a report in one way or another, um, because otherwise, you know, we can't be selective in what we report on um, in a way that might favour one side or the other, because that can be that can attest to our credibility. If it looks like you're hiding something in order to get a particular result or a particular outcome, then that's very um, unethical. Okay, we also need to be open and be able to pass on information about the tests that we've done. You know, to be, they're not kind of proprietary secrets. Um, you know, especially when we, we're basing them on, on well-established tests and methods, that we need to be upfront about what that involves. And also to be able to communicate to um, lay people, so people who are not necessarily scientific, about what those tests involve. Okay, and then also we need to be careful in signing off on reports, that the person who signs off on the report and stands by it is the person who wrote it, or the person who was um, closely involved with its production. Okay, you can't just be signing off on a report that you had nothing to do with, because ultimately you need to, you're need you accountable for what that evidence involves, what that report involves, and if you sign off on something that you had nothing to do with, then that can actually be a very serious matter indeed. Okay. Now we're going to think about how do we conduct ourselves in the lead up to a trial or, or giving evidence in court. It's important that we allow both sides of the, the, the case sufficient time to read through and, and process our reports. Okay, so we're not dropping things in at 4.59 on a Friday afternoon when court's scheduled for first thing Monday morning. Okay, that's that's not reasonable. You need to make sure that it's, it's where possible or where the, the date's been known of in advance that you need to make sure that it's, it's able um, it's out there early enough for people to be able to read, process, they might want to consult with alternative experts, they need to kind of, the lawyers need to get their heads around what's there, you know, and then how to proceed. So it's important that your report's available. Um, we also got to um, be prepared to have an open discussion with other experts that might be involved, okay, because you don't get owned by one side or another. If you have one expert on one side and another expert on the other side, there's nothing to say that they um, cannot speak to each other, okay, or that they can't be spoken to by um, other the other representatives of the other parties. That there's it's an open conversation. It needs to be beforehand, okay, as opposed to this gotcha kind of secret business. Um, that's really important, okay. And then also, um, in legal terms, that often what is is done is as I'm called a retainer where someone is paid an upfront fee for a certain amount of work that they're going to do and then perhaps they might bill for additional work. Um, and this is how often some lawyers will work, that they'll take a retainer, that you pay them a set fee and then and, and then they kind of work beyond that. Um, but what happens in legal proceedings for an expert is that if you are being paid by one side, then you can't be paid by the other side. Okay, and then you could imagine a scenario where one side would pay for the at the retainer or the, the fee for an expert purely so that the other side can't use them. Not because they're actually wanting to use the evidence, but just as a we got them first kind of scenario. Okay, and so um, the idea being that if, if the expert suspects that that is what's going on, then they need to refuse it. You need to be open and honest to, to actually to, to say no, that's that's they're doing the wrong thing um, and to knock that back. Okay, let's think about conduct in court. How do we conduct ourselves when we're giving evidence in a court um, where a jury may or may not be involved? It might be a jury trial, it may just be a judge, um, but how do we do that? Just like our reports, our evidence needs to be straightforward language. We're communicating to, in most cases, non-scientific people, and certainly people who don't have the level of expertise that you do, and so it's important that your language is accessible and understandable. If the jury gets so bored by all the jargon that they fall asleep and they don't pay attention, um, that doesn't help anybody. It doesn't help your credibility, and it also doesn't allow your evidence to be given its full weight. It might be, they might just listen to the first thing and then dismiss it. And they may also dismiss you as a, a stuffy, kind of boring, you know, 
you're a university professor professor style person that, that talks above them okay and that doesn't help you've got to make sure that uh, you stay within your expertise and then you're not pressured to by one side or the other to comment on areas that are outside your expertise and you need you just need to be upfront and stating that that no that's beyond my area of expertise i can't offer an opinion on that okay you need to make sure that you you cultivate or you develop an objective and moderate manner in giving evidence okay it's not a grandstanding it's not a performance it's not a show but it's also not a, um, a dry lecture that you need to make sure that the way you give evidence is very matter of fact you need to be prepared to disclose all tests and experiment that you performed again there's no secrets here and you also need to be able to articulate what that involves to help communicate the the relevance of it to um, the court the jury the judge the, the other people who are present okay why were those why do those tests matter what information do they provide why would you choose those and not something else you also need to make sure it's really clear, as in your report, um, that you distinguish between facts and results and the opinions, as well as also noting any limitations that are there so that they can kind of give them their proper due. Okay, They're not, not putting too much weight or too little weight on what you have to say. Okay, And then also, if you suspect that the questions that are being asked are, are being done in a very tricky or misleading way so that there's a big or noticeable kind of... Um, um, significant piece of information is is being hidden that you need to be prepared to go above the lawyers heads and actually to appeal to the to the, the magistrate or to the judge um, to say to to articulate that fact as long as the jury is not there because they may well be influenced by that information um, in a in an unfair way that 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 it needs to be cleared up so that the questioning is not tricky so that only certain bits of information get um, put forward Okay, and then just thinking generally in how we conduct ourselves in the field of forensics, it is possible and reasonable to advise on opposing experts. Okay, so if you are on one side and there is an expert who is working for the other side of the case, it's quite reasonable that you can advise on their work and you can read their report and provide um, information to the lawyers on your side, even though that might be used in cross-examination during court. That's okay. There's nothing underhanded about that, um, as long as it's all conducted in a way that's not just trying to smear someone or, or um, you know, anything untoward like that. But you know, the, perhaps you, as the expert, are the one who can provide useful information to the lawyer on your side about the other expert that they wouldn't otherwise know. Okay, that's not sneaky. Um, it, you know, it's, that's just a reasonable thing to do to give context. Okay, you've got to make sure that you maintain confidentiality. Okay, so told information that's provided in confidence stays that way. Okay, and it's also important not to basically media grandstand or trying to get your name known for particular cases that may come up. So courting the media spotlight. Some, for depending on the case, some media scrutiny is, um, ex, you know, is possible or expected, um, but it shouldn't be cultivated. You know, becoming a big celebrity on purpose is not part of what this is about. It doesn't mean that you must be... Um, you know, be like a, an exiled monk or somewhere that you, you have to deliberately, you know, do everything you can to stay out of the media. Um, sometimes it just happens, but it's important that you, you don't try to make an issue of it. You also behave in a really professional, you have professional conduct. The way that you deal with other experts, the way that you deal with clients is professional, is, you know, very responsible and, and adult, as opposed to um, anything underhanded or, or sneaky or anything like that. You're also making sure that you're not behaving as a hired gun, okay? So that you're not rendering any services where the fee depends on what you have to say, okay? Your fee needs to be for the work that you do, not buying a particular outcome. Unfortunately, some experts will do this, but it must be avoided at all costs, okay? Because it, it uh, undermines the whole profession. Um, if one expert is inclined to, to do the right thing, um, they may be shunned in favor of the expert that will say whatever you want to say for for a fee um you know it, it basically it loses all credibility for the industry and so it's really important to avoid it actively avoid it and also if there happens to be any errors or omissions anything that comes up later that that you need to be prepared to change your opinion to um to be open and say look that this this was excluded you know perhaps it was negligence perhaps it was just simply overlooked. But rather than kind of keep it to yourself, you need to speak up about when things like that will happen. Okay, so you can see that there's a whole lot of different guidelines here to give you some information about how 
we can behave ethically in forensics in the whole kind of the, the, the way the variety of different areas that a forensic scientist would be involved. All right. Thanks very much for watching. Bye for now.